Hello, hello everyone and welcome to week six of the Eldorado series where we teach you how to make a feature length film in seven weeks. You know all that by now. It's the sixth week. Your challenge is to read and study chapter five, which I'll help you to do in a minute. Then we'll plan out the structure to finish our story and then we'll write and film a flashback explaining the plot and pushing us onto the climax of our story, which we'll write and film next week. Dun dun dun! So let's continue with the adventure and read chapter five. Chapter five, The City of Gold. Blow me down, it's Louis, quick! Solomon yelled as the powerful Spaniard kicked into top gear. Oh, run like the wind, <sighs> Solomon puffed, oh, on a very windy day. By the time he had finished his sentence, Vallejo was already 30 metres in front of him. She was incredibly quick off the mark. Gradually, Solomon began to catch it up, his lungs burning like a red-hot furnace. Gad, Gad, Zooks, he gasped. This girl can run fast. Louis was just behind, relentlessly pounding his gigantic feet into the ground. Banova, who was beginning to realise that she may have been tricked, but thought that now might not be a good time to ask questions, was keeping pace too. All four were now separated by only a few measly metres. The slope became steeper. The runners ran harder, the top of the hill approaching ever closer towards them. Whoever reached the summit first would be the winner. El Dorado was within reach and Solomon was leading Louis. Thousands of miles had been travelled and it was all coming down to this. Try as he might, Louis simply couldn't gain ground. In a desperate, last ditch attempt to win, he flung himself forward full length, grabbing at Solomon's ankles. At that exact moment, Solomon dodged a humongous heap of horse manure. Roaring like a lion, Louis stretched, grabbed and missed Solomon, landing face first in the stink. Exhausted, Solomon stood wheezing at the top of the hill, the winner. Louis looked up at him, slowly wiping his face. Banova moved towards him. With a heart full of bitterness, he turned to face the direction he had come from. Don't come near me, growled Louis. All three watched until he had trudged out of sight. Solomon turned triumphantly to claim his prize and froze his jaw almost hitting the floor. Solomon was gutted. There were no glistening avenues. There was no gilded houses. There were no golden treasures at all. There was just a lake. A great big blue wet lake. Kneeling at the water's edge, an old man was throwing things into the stillness. Solomon checked the map. He checked it again. He scampered to a new lookout point, then another and another. He stopped. He stared at the sun. He checked a final time. This was definitely it. This was the Eldorado that Columbus had marked on the map. Panicking, he ran over to the old man. What on earth has happened? I beg you, please tell me what has happened to the City of Gold. I am afraid to tell you, my friend, that there is no City of Gold. What? But this is Eldorado. I came here especially to find gold. Christopher Columbus told me all about it. The old man smiled kindly and introduced himself as the chief of the local tribe. There is no place called El Dorado, my friend. It is a myth that greedy Europeans, desperate for wealth, have invented. We do have some gold, it is true, but we throw it into this lake. For the second time, Solomon's jaw dropped open like a drawbridge of a castle. It, into the lake? He croaked. Y yes, right here, Lake Guatavita, nodded the chief, still smiling. It is an offering to our god, the sun god. The gold shines like him. Solomon, for once, was speechless. Solomon, Baiho, and Baniva were invited to stay with the tribe leader and his people, the Muska, until they had recovered from their exhausting adventures. It didn't take long for Solomon to understand that the Europeans and South Americans had completely opposite uses for gold. For Europeans, 
gold was worth a lot of money, and having it made you rich and powerful. For the Muska, it was simply a shiny metal that could be used as an offering to their sun god. At the end of the fourth day, batteries fully recharged, Solomon, Bayoho and Banava said their goodbye to the Muska tribe and beautiful Lake Guatavita. Solomon was disappointed that El Dorado wasn't real, but he had made lots of new friends, especially the two companions with whom he was now embarking on the long journey back to Cartagena. Shame about the loot, but what an absolute rip-snorter of an adventure! Once we hit Cartagena, I say we rescue the jolly flobbers and buy a host friends from that scurvy dog Bar Barbosa and take everyone back home. We can drop you off on that Caribbean island you were taken from to Banova. The three friends, arm in arm, laughed raucously, talking about how good it would feel to be home. At long last, they walked into the crimson fading sunset. If this was the end, we could leave our heroes walking happily into the sunset. Then we would have had an extremely happy ending. A warm, fuzzy, well done to the good guys kind of ending. But this isn't quite the end. Something else was happening. It took eight days, but Louis Jimenez made his way through the rainforest to his ship. Vamos amigos! shouted Jimenez, his band of rogues gathered around him. We are going to the city of gold. We are going to El Dorado. We'll return with gold statues, gold crowns, gold shoes and gold teeth. We'll be rich beyond our wildest dreams. Vamos! The oath he had sworn to Columbus, for the loser of the race never to return to El Dorado, was about to be broken. He was going back to take everything by force. He was going to ransack an entire city of gold. For three days and nights, Louis and his men trampled furiously through the rainforest at devastating speed. Finally, they arrived at Lake Guatavita, sweaty, greedy and terribly confused at the lack of gold to be seen. Louis shouted impatiently at an old man who was throwing shiny trinkets into the lake. Where is he? Where is he? The Englishman, where is the gold? The Englishman left about a week ago, the chief replied calmly. There is no gold. He tried to continue and to offer the same explanation he had given to Solomon. Louis, however, wasn't listening. He had already turned and marched away, yelling as he went. All the way back to the Amazon, all the way back to his ship. He never was one for listening. Ah! He screamed, as loud as a hippopotamus with a toothache. That vermin Clegg, I curse you! How dare you steal the gold! All the gold! May the fleas of a thousand donkeys infest your armpits! I will have my revenge, Clegg. That much I promise. I will have my revenge. I curse your name and all who come after you. Many years later, Jimenez was heard muttering the same words on his deathbed. The end. That's it for the chapter book of El Dorado. Hope you enjoyed that tale. So this part of the story, this structure of the story, is something we're going to delve into today because we'll be learning about how to structure the last part of our story, but also thinking back about what we've already done, just so if you ever want to write your own movie script, if you want to be a Netflix writer or a writer, a film writer of the future, then this is something that you can use. So on the screen you can see a graph which plots a hero's journey. It shows how fortunate they are. And this is just one story structure that we, you can use, but we'll be using this for El Dorado today. Now it follows, going from left to right, the time of the story or the film. So at the very beginning, you can see they're just a little bit above good fortune, probably, and then they might find something wonderful. And in our story, don't forget, it was Chris Columbus's map that was written for Louis Jimenez and Solomon Clegg to find. But in your story, it could have been your letter that you wrote in week two. And then as the story progresses, things get harder and they come across lots of obstacles, which means that the provisions maybe they had are starting to run out, the equipment that they have starting to break, and everyone starts to just get a bit more irritable with each other in the group. Until finally something bad really happens here. 
And in both our story of Louis Jimenez and Solomon Clegg, they eventually got to Lake Guatavita only to find out that there was no gold there. It was all a myth. It was all a lie to trick greedy, greedy Westerners. But in your story, it might be something totally different. They might finally reach the place that they've been meaning to get to only to find that there is a big disappointment there. And you've already talked about that in the previous weeks. So in this week, we're going to explain why that bad thing has happened. We're going to be doing something called a flashback. A flashback that explains that part of the story and explains the twist. Because one thing that people do often do is they will they'll put a, a twist in the story and then not explain why that twist happens. And it's obviously just written in the story just for the sake of it. But if you explain why the twist happens, and you can decide to show all the events leading up to that twist, then it makes it much more believable and the audience feel much more satisfied um, with that twist. Now, a flashback is all about going back in time. It shows an earlier part of the story that the director or the writer has chosen not to include earlier in the story. And this is often used to explain a key part, or sometimes you can even have a flashback quite early on in the story just to hook the reader in and get them engaged, but not give away the whole plot. But we're going to use it here to explain the key part of the story and the key twist in your story. And in our El Dorado tale, a flashback, if we had one, would go straight into page 19. And the flashback would explore why Chris Columbus was important in sharing this myth of El Dorado and why that was important in order for greedy Europeans desperate for wealth to be taught a lesson. So what clue are your adventurers going to find that just gives them a bit more information that takes us on this flashback journey in your story? So our characters in our movies who are going to Lake Guatavita finally reach there, are disappointed that there's no El Dorado, they're heading back to Cartagena now, maybe they are delivered an extra part of Chris Columbus's letter by one of the local tribespeople. Maybe in your story they could have a letter given to them, or they could have a discussion with someone else, like one of the elders of the local tribe, to find out more information about why this twist has happened. I can imagine Chris Columbus leaving a voicemail on, on, on Louis Jimenez's or Solomon Clegg's phones if it was set in today's world. What would that voicemail be like? Maybe that could be a fun example just to try out, just have, have, a, have a little draft of, just to see if that works. That's a mini challenge today, is to leave a voicemail from Chris Columbus to Louis Jimenez or Solomon Clegg explaining the tale. So as soon as they got to El Dorado and found there's no gold, oh, just Lake Guatavita, oh no. Shock horror, totes embarrassing. <laughs> What's Chris Columbus's message going to say in order to explain that? Nice activity to do. But your challenge for today is to create your own flashback to the history of your story. So what actually happened in the past of your story? What is the main twist? How are you going to explain your main twist? What information have you kept hidden from the viewer or the reader all the way through the story up until this point? Ours could have been that Chris Columbus secretly was part of a secret order that wanted to trap and rob Europeans as they came to find Guatavita. And maybe that'll happen next. And how does this affect the structure of your story? Just think about that last point. Does it make it more exciting? Does it give a bit of a, oh, feeling to the audience just before you hit them with a big action sequence next week, which is really exciting then. So here are some quick ideas and you can borrow any of these, or of course do your own. The treasure was never real and they used the story to attract tourists. The destination is cursed to protect another much more dangerous secret. That could be quite an interesting one. Thirdly, there is an ancient order protecting what your adventurers are searching after, and they have been spreading lies and misinformation to stop them finding the truth. Maybe the actual El Dorado is rip, next door. Or is it something else? So you can pick one of those, or you're very welcome to choose your own. All we want you to do is write notes on your flashback explaining what happened in the past. So when did this happen? Who was there? Where were they? And why were they there? So our conversation could be a conversation between Chris Columbus and the local tribes people coming together to plan how they're going to trick Westerners to come to El Dorado and waste money. Paragraph two, what do they discuss? What do they want? 
They could be discussing lots of different ways in order to trick and get gold from, from Westerners at this point. Are they going to become pirates and rob them on the sea? No, we don't have any ships. Are they going to sell spa sessions in Lake Guatavita? No, probably not. It's not always that hot. Or are they going to create a legendary tale in order for Westerners to come, park their boats on the shoreline, run up to Lake Guatavita, and then they rob their ships? That's not a bad idea. Yeah, let's go with that. So you can have them discussing lots of ideas. Some might work, some may not work. And then finally, paragraph three, what is revealed? What impact does this have on your story? So this could be the point where Chris Columbus decides to write his letter to Louis Jimenez and Solomon Clegg, right then and there in front of the tribe. And that he's chosen Louis Jimenez and Solomon Clegg because he knows they will spread the tale. Particularly Louis Jimenez, who thought it was all stolen by Solomon Clegg. When you've written all this up, please share your flashback with someone else you know who knows your story well. What do they think? Is there something that needs to be resolved or still explained to finish it all off? Remember, we're just writing notes today. We're going to be scripting a bit more in tomorrow's session. When you do that, we'd love to see your notes. Of course, I can't get enough of those lovely, lovely fresh notes. Notes of honey, lovely in the air. <laughs> Send them in to us, info at litfilmfest.com, at litfilmfest on Twitter, or on the Facebook page, Lit Film Fest Classrooms. You know it, it's all there on the screen. So thank you everyone for joining us. We're also, on the 15th of June, going to be celebrating everyone's work in a special homeschool showcase. So send in your work, we want to celebrate it. And if you are interested in having your work showcased at that Lit Film Fest showcase event, then get in touch with us. We, we want to be able to celebrate you. It'll be a fantastic showcase of all the hard work that you've been put in. I can't wait to celebrate things in a really big way. So do please send us in your work. We want to do and celebrate want to celebrate it, mummy. I want to celebrate it. Bye. I want to take off. Oh, too much energy. Oh.